In this section, I'm going to talk about a classification of viruses, and then I'm going to talk about select um, infectious particles and COVID-19. So an informal classification system classifies viruses on whether they infect animal, plant, or bacterial cells, whether they're enveloped or naked, whether they have DNA or RNA as their genetic makeup, and whether they're helical or icosahedral. A formal classification system is dependent on the virus's structure, chemical composition, and the similarities in genetic makeup. Virus orders end in virales, virus families end in viridae, and virus genera end in virus. So if you remember back, we had um, domain, which was that major classification system where we divided them into archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. We don't have um, domains, kingdoms, phylums when we talk about viruses um, or classes. But we do have orders, families, and genera. Um, so we have orders that end in alis or viralis, families that end in viridae, and genera, which end in virus. So this is an example of some classification systems. So here we have herpes viralis is the order, herpes viridae is the family, simplex virus is the genus, and the species is her human herpes virus 2. The host for this one is an animal. Now this table goes through some important families, genera, and common names and types of diseases of some DNA viruses. And then there's another couple tables that will follow this. With all of these viruses, you can just quickly review each one of these tables and get some background information about these. You will not be tested on these early on in the semester, but you may be tested on them during the last week of the semester when we talk about all of the different types of infectious diseases. So we'll spend some time going through the bacterial and viral infectious diseases at the end, and that's when you'll be responsible for this information. But this is just for you to review and kind of take a look at uh, now. So don't worry about memorizing anything like on here for a test. So here's some RNA viruses, more RNA viruses, and more RNA viruses. And now we get to COVID-19. So COVID-19, the World Health Organization named the novel coronavirus that causes the disease, COVID-19, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, so SARS-CoV-2 in January of 2020. The disease is named from a contraction of the term coronavirus disease 2019. So that's why we call it COVID-19. So either term is correct. The WHO prefers SARS-CoV-2, and most people just commonly call it COVID-19. This disease was first observed in humans in Wuhan, China in December of 2019, but now emerging data is kind of suggesting that it was around a little bit before then, and it may have even been in the United States in December of 2019. The WHO declared COVID-19 a public health emergency of international concern on January 30th, 2020. So um, it's a pretty long time from the time it was first observed to the time that they actually said it was a public health emergency. And there's all different reasons for this. You need to make sure that there's um, this is a severe infection, that it has a high attack rate, meaning that it can infect many people uh, that are exposed and so forth. So there's a lot of criteria and it takes a while to evaluate data before you can um, make such a claim. And I do want to warn you as I go through here, this is um, January of or sorry, December of 2020 now. So it's still early on. We don't know much about the virus as of now. And these slides were created in May of 2020. So um, the information may be a little outdated, but because this is so new, we're still learning uh, about it as we go. So just understand that I'm giving you what we know at this time, to the best of our knowledge, what we are familiar with at this time. But um, this information is going to be helpful in helping you understand the severity of this disease. So there's three main coronaviruses that have crossed the species barrier since 2000. So SARS um, emerged in 2002 
infecting 8,000 people, causing 774 deaths across five continents. Then we had MERS emerge in 2012, and that remains a public health concern, although a very small number of people actually contracted this infection. And now we have SARS-CoV-2, which was identified in December of 2019. Both SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 likely originated from bats as a reservoir with small mammals as intermediate hosts between bat and human. So small mammals um, mediated the transmission from the bat to the human. MERS originated from a camel with direct transfer to humans. And then there's four low pathogenicity coronaviruses that are endemic to humans, which means that um, they're not very infectious. They don't cause any major diseases. Um, some of them can cause common colds in us and they, they're just found in humans all the time. As of May 2020, there are no approved treatments or vaccines for any coronavirus species. However, now there are some um, FDA approved treatments and vaccines are being developed um, and supposedly they're gonna be released pretty soon. So uh, like I said, this is still early on. Uh, so this is the information that we have today. So this is what coronavirus looks like there's been pictures all over the news about what this um, virus looks like. So the S proteins protrude from the viral surface, which resembles a crown or a corona. SARS-CoV-2 belongs to the genus beta coronavirus, the family coronaviridae. It's an enveloped virus with an unsegmented single-stranded positive sense RNA genome. So if you're asked any questions about COVID-19, you're gonna be asked questions like, is it enveloped or naked? What is its genetic composition? So you wanna know that it's an enveloped virus and it's single-stranded positive sense RNA genome. So what does this mean? It has a piece of RNA as its genetic material. And that piece of RNA, once inside of our cells, gets converted directly to protein. So it takes over our cell um, machinery and it causes our cells to produce protein directly from that piece of RNA. It's comprised of four main structural proteins. You don't need to uh, be too concerned about those structural proteins that it has, but this is just some general information. Some people like to know more. Some people uh, just want the bare essentials to be able to pass the test questions on this. The genome also codes for 16 non-structural proteins that are involved in viral replication, maturation, and release. It can be transmitted from animal to human by direct contact and human to human by droplet. Direct contact means close contact, so uh, we would have to directly touch an animal or directly come in contact somehow with that animal. Human to human uh, spread by, by a droplet. Droplets are um, small particles that are released every time a person coughs, sneezes, or talks even. And those droplets can spread up to 16, six feet. Um, and some people are saying it's a little bit farther than that. Studies suggest that the virus can also become aerosolized and travel farther, remaining viable for up to three hours in the air. Indirect transmission by fomite is also a concern since the virus can remain viable on surfaces such as plastic for up to three days. This, um, it's more likely to get it in the air or get it by droplet contact than it is by fomite. Fomite means that the virus drops on an inanimate surface. So if a person had COVID and they coughed on a shopping cart and then another person that was not infected yet touched that shopping cart and then happened to um, touch their face or something like that. That would be fomite, fomite um, indirect transmission. So the infectious particle was dropped on an inanimate surface and someone came along and touched it. Now we're not too concerned about that as a method of transmission. However, they're still encouraging the use of hand sanitizer, washing hands frequently to make sure that you aren't indirectly getting it um, by fomite transmission. Viral particles have been found in fecal samples and there is accumulating evidence for fecal oral transmission. It has also been found in high concentrations in semen and other body fluids. So there is a, a risk and it's um, suggested that you may even be able to get it by flushing a toilet. So if a patient is infected with COVID-19 and it comes out in the urine, you flush the toilet, it aerosolizes, and you may even get it from a public restroom that way. So there's a lot of different things um, that, that are suspected now as far as transmission goes. 
In population-dense areas, large public gatherings and facilities such as prisons, cruise ships, and senior living centers provide ideal conditions for the spread of this virus. Portals of entry. So how does it get inside of you? Through your nose and oral passageway. This is why they're advising people to wear masks that cover both the nose and the mouth. Masks are not 100% effective, but it's something. You know, two people are both wearing a mask. The likelihood that droplets are going to spread is a lot lower. And if you're wearing masks and you're keeping a distance, the likelihood that those droplets are going to be able to make it through your mask across a six, six foot distance and through someone else's mask are very low. So um, it decreases the likelihood that you're going to have transmission. It doesn't eliminate it. So some people think, oh, I'm wearing a mask. I'm 100% safe. That's not true. Other people say masks aren't effective at all. I'm not even going to bother. That's also not true. So masks do something and they do something to help prevent the spread of this virus. Once transmitted, viral S proteins bind to host cells via angiotensin converting enzyme 2, ACE2. So if you've ever heard of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, this is a system in place that senses high blood pressure and this enzyme, this ACE2 um, enzyme, allows the uh, conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, which will uh, kind of continue that cascade on decreasing your blood pressure. Who has high blood pressure? Well, people with diabetes, people that are a little bit overweight or considered obese. And those are the people that tend to be more heavily impacted by this virus. ACE2, its physiological function is to lower blood pressure, control fluid balance, and regulate the inflammatory response. So those people that have uh, a lot of inflammatory reactions happening, autoimmune diseases, they have a lot of this receptor. These proteins are present in many tissues, including the lungs, kidneys, heart, arteries, and gastrointestinal tract. So these proteins, wherever they are, that's where the virus can enter into your cells. So it's a wide variety of places. This is kind of why we have the, the risk of um, cardiovascular issues when we have patients that are infected with this. This is why we have major lung issues. The more the patient has high blood pressure, the more autoimmune disease they have or diabetes, the more of these proteins they're going to have, which increases their susceptibility to this virus. Multicellular tropism accounts for the high rate of infectivity. Like I said, this virus can infect a lot of different cell types, so that's why um, people can get so badly infected by this. So there's different stages to this virus. Stage one is the asymptomatic state. The incubation time is about four to five days, but it has a range of two to 14 days. The virus is detected by a nasal swab and is shed by the host in droplets. The virus propagates and you have mild innate immune responses that are initiated. So immediately, once you get it, it takes some time. Incubation time means it's the time from when you get the virus to the time when you actually start to show some symptoms. Then stage two begins, and you have upper airway and um, conducting airway responses. So there's a huge immune response. Clinical ma manifestations of the disease usually appear two to 14 days post-exposure. So you start to have symptoms two to four day 14 days after you've been exposed. They include cough, fever, shortness of breath, chills, muscle pain, loss of taste and or smell, sore throat, nausea, diarrhea. Up to 80% of COVID-19 cases will either be asymptomatic or will arrest at this stage. So in what we know so far, if you end up losing your sense of smell and taste from this virus, you probably are okay. You probably will recover completely because this hasn't transferred deeper into the lungs. You have the upper respiratory tract and it kind of ends in the upper respiratory tract. So it stays there and it does some nerve damage, which, um, or nerve interference, which is corrected. About one to two months after people fully recover from this, usually their sense of smell and taste are starting to come back or are fully back. But there's that 20% of people who go on to develop stage three. Stage three is hypoxia, so um, lack of oxygen. It's progression to acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, within eight to 12 days. Critical care and hospitalization is necessary. 
early on when people were getting this, they threw everyone on a ventilator. And that ventilator actually caused more damage. So the goal is to keep people off of the ventilator for as long as they possibly can because the vent and pressure can cause secondary infections and can cause the lungs to rupture or blow out and um, cause more severe symptoms as opposed to keeping them off the vent. Supplementary oxygen is different from a ventilator. So a ventilator um, is a mechanical breathing machine that's gonna you know, force air into the lungs while supplemental oxygen is just oxygen. It's pure, pure oxygen that you can breathe in on your own. Approximately 15% of COVID-19 patients require oxygen, 5% require ve ventilation. The percentage that require ventilation is increasing recently. So uh, it seems like every holiday that we have, we have a huge peak. So there was a huge peak around Labor Day. Uh, we had a lot of cases start to climb up and um, then people went back to school. And we saw a huge peak following people going back to school. It slowly started to decrease and then we had Thanksgiving and then there's the big Thanksgiving peak and I can uh, anticipate that once Christmas comes there's going to be another huge peak Christmas and New Year's and winter break um, as people want to be with their families during the holidays this is going to cause more and more peaks of these cases. When cases peak like this, that causes a lot of patients to rush to the hospitals and hospitals become short staffed. And they start to have to make difficult decisions as far as conserving PPE, um, who to treat, who, who can they save, um, who gets the treatments first. And when you start to be constrained in the healthcare system and have to make those difficult decisions, that's when um, more mistakes can be made and more human lives can suffer from just the influx of patients with this virus. So manifestations of ARDS include pneumonia, difficulty breathing, persistent chest pain, pressure, confusion, inability to stay awake, and bluish lips or skin. Oxygen levels fall as lung becomes, lungs become filled with fluid, white blood cells, mucus, and cellular debris. A cytokine storm, which is a hyperimmune response or a hyperinflammatory response, leads to a dramatic drop in blood pressure, leaky blood vessels, and the formation of blood clots and organ failure. So these are the different organ systems that are affected in critical care patients. And I'll give you a chance to um, pause the video at this time and you can just read through all of these different areas that can be affected. The multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children um, with exposure to SARS-CoV-2 was first reported in April of 2020, but as of May um, 2020, the risk factors of contracting this are unknown, and symptoms include persistent fever, hypotension, which is low blood pressure, rashes, and these are extreme rashes all over the skin uh, that are very obvious and noticeable. Multi-organ involvement, include the, including the kidneys, heart, GI tract, vasculature, neurological um, involvement, and then inflammation. There haven't been too many cases of this reported, but it was a major concern early on in, um, in emergence of this virus. Risk factors. It's important to note that COVID-19 can affect anyone. As a new disease, ongoing research is being conducted to determine risk factors for severe illness or complications. Certain populations are at higher risk of more severe infection, not higher risk of getting infected. And that's important because it's misconstrued a lot. They think, oh, well, if I'm not over the age of 65, then I'm never gonna get it, I'm immune. Not true. You could definitely still get it. You may be asymptomatic. You may not develop those severe symptoms. You may not even think to go get tested. However, you can definitely still get it. And even asymptomatic patients may suffer from unexplained changes after exposure to the virus. Anyone with underlying medical conditions such as diabetes, asthma, kidney disease, pulmonary disease, blood disorders, obesity, metabolic syndrome, heart conditions, that's all again related to that um, ACE2 receptor, that protein that this virus binds to. So the more receptor, the more that protein you have, the more you're gonna uh, be affected by this disease. Immunocompromised individuals due to AIDS, cancer, blood or organ transplantation, and immune deficiencies are also at high risk. So now I'm gonna um, pause and tell you a little bit about my personal experience with the virus. So both of my parents ended up getting uh, COVID-19. 
And when my parents got COVID-19, uh, it began with my dad. My dad uh, contracted it from somewhere out in public and they were both taking precautions. They were both wearing masks, washing their hands, hand sanitizer. They did everything that they were advised to and my dad ended up getting it anyways. So my dad got sick um, about two days after he was out in the public and, on, and out and exposed. And he got very sick very fast. Um, at day two, he was pretty weak. He couldn't really get out of his chair, uh, very uh, cold all the time, and his skin looked pale. His blood pressure was low, which is unusual for him because he has high blood pressure. Um, and he was, just looked generally uh, weak. About two days later, my mom came down with symptoms. And my mom, too, was very sick, um, difficult for her to move around. A couple days later, after my parents um, told me about their symptoms and uh, I kind of looked at them a little bit and said, you should probably go get tested because they were both very sick. And my parents are generally healthy uh, people, so having them get so sick so fast was pretty concerning. They went and got tested and it turned out that they were both positive. So they quarantined in their homes. A couple days later, after getting tested um, positive, this was about, by this time, it had been about day 12 for my dad and day 10 for my mom. My dad um, suddenly, in the middle of the night, said it's time for him to go to the hospital. He was unable to breathe. He looked very pale. He could barely stand up. The ambulance came, and I, I managed to get to the driveway when they were taking him away, but he was unable to breathe. It was very difficult for him to um, take a breath and talk even. He was in a lot of pain. So they took him to the hospital. They started him on a treatment of remdesivir and dexamethasone. And remdesivir I'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, remdesivir is, was approved as an emergency treatment by the FDA recently. And um, they put him through a five day course of remdesivir. And then the dexamethasone as well. So my dad um, exposed, you know, he, he went to the hospital. He had all of those respiratory symptoms and he had to have supplemental oxygen. His oxygen levels were really low, but never required a vent. The second day that he was there, they managed to give him that convalescent plasma. So he had one day's worth of remdesivir before they gave him the convalescent plasma. The plasma was like a miracle drug. Um, within eight hours, he was breathing on his own. He was off of supplemental oxygen, and he made almost a complete recovery. The problem is, Dexamethasone has some weird side effects. So although it can open your airways and stop inflammatory reactions from progressing, my dad ended up developing type 2 diabetes after ha being, uh, being exposed to that dexamethasone. So he has diabetes now, which is terrible. He also has this chronic nerve pain in his legs. Both of his legs have shrunk to about a third of the size as what they were uh, due to the nerve damage from this. And they're not sure of whether it's due to the diabetes. Um, di diabetic nef nef uh, neuritis um, can cause some issues or whether it's due to, um, so that would be the dexamethasone related uh, issue or if it's due to COVID-19 directly. But it's difficult for him to stand up and walk still and uh, his legs still buckle when he tries to walk long distances. So uh, there's definitely some long-term symptoms that we're noticing with my dad. Now with my mom's story, she seemed to have a milder case. She got the um, loss of the sense of smell and taste and she was very sick and very weak at home, but it wasn't too concerning because she was still able to walk around and breathe normally. It was just mostly the extreme fatigue, the cough, and the inability to taste and smell anything. About two days after my dad was admitted to the hospital, my mom called me up uh, in a panic. She was in a severe amount of pain. I couldn't go into the house, but I was outside in the driveway and I was watching her and she was screaming in pain. Uh, I called the ambulance and I was running through my head, what could this possibly be? What's wrong? She was complaining of pain in her upper back predominantly on the right side, a little bit on the left side, but the pain was so excruciating, it was irradiating through to her chest. So I was thinking, could this be a heart attack? Could this be a, the cardiac um, arrest type syndrome that is associated with this virus? But then I started thinking, wait, she just had knee surgery. And when she sat down for a period of time, she, uh, you know, having COVID, you didn't want to walk around much, that could have led to the development of blood clots in her legs. So. I called the ambulance, they took her to the, to the hospital, and I immediately called the ER doctor and I said, I think my mom has uh, pulmonary emboli. I think she's got 
clots, blood clots in her lungs. She had knee surgery recently, and I feel that the sudden onset of pain in the area that she's describing is, is pulmonary emboli. So the doctor, not thinking to even test for that, drew uh, labs for a D-dimer and levels were elevated. Sure enough, after a chest x-ray and MRI, they determined that she did have pulmonary emboli. That's one of the symptoms, actually, and 25% of patients, even not having any history of surgery, end up developing large clots in their lungs. My mom was so close to death with these uh, clots being in her lungs, it was terrifying. Uh, she now has to wait for six months for these clots to completely dissolve from her lungs. And she's still pretty weak and fatigued, and it's been uh, two to three months after exposure. She just now got her sense of taste and smell back, but she still has to deal with the blood thinners and with having these clots in her lungs. There is a risk that those clots are going to come back for her. So having almost lost both of my parents to this virus, I know firsthand how dangerous it is and how fast it can progress to a very scary state. So I hope that you guys take this and uh, kind of take this information and understand that this isn't a joke, it's not a political thing. This is serious and there's a lot of people that are dying. Uh, my parents didn't really have a lot of underlying health conditions and this, this happened to them. So um, thank God both of my parents are alive, but they will be dealing with the aftermath of this virus for the rest of their lives. As far as diagnos diagnosis, so there's two different tests. There's the rapid test and the PCR test. PCR test looks for the genetic material of the virus. So it tries to replicate a segment of the RNA if it's present in the person's secretions. It is extremely accurate, but it takes a couple days. It's a long process just to perform the PCR test in and of itself. So, and if you think about how many millions of tests are going through the labs at this time, uh, it takes a long time to be able to get to all of those tests, to sample them, process them, and so forth. The antigen test looks for the antigen of the virus. It has, it's called the point of care test or POC test, and this is a rapid test. You get your results uh, within a couple minutes. The problem is it's not accurate. So its inaccuracy is an issue. And usually they do both tests to increase the accuracy. So they'll give you the rapid test first, and then they'll do, run the PCR in the background, and then they'll call you if anything changes with the PCR results. But um, that rapid test is really not, or really shouldn't be used as a standalone test. Antibody tests, look for the antibody of the virus in a person's serum. If they've been exposed, then they probably have antibodies against it. The problem is that these antibodies go away pretty quickly, and it doesn't necessarily mean that the person uh, has some long-lasting protection against the virus. So, um, as it notes down here, as of May 2020, we don't know if the presence of antibodies in the blood provides long-term protection. We still don't know as of December 2020. So um, we don't know, even if we do get a vaccine, how many other types or times we could potentially get this, how often we would need a booster vaccine to prevent against this. And it's suggested that these antibodies only stay in the serum for four to six months after exposure. Prevention, wash your hands often, use hand sanitizer, uh, maintain a social distance, cover the mouth and nose, you wanna wear a face covering, and clean and disinfect frequently. Vaccines, under normal circumstances, it would take more than 15 years to develop a vaccine, but this was an emergency situation, so a vaccine, um, or many vaccines, over 100 vaccines were in development within the first couple months after this was declared a, um, a public health emergency. So within the first couple months, they had all these vaccines, they started doing human trials right away, and they kind of rushed some vaccines to the market already in other countries. And now there's a, a front runner from Pfizer that looks pretty promising that um, they're going to be creating and putting on the market. Drugs. So as of today, there are some uh, approved drugs. Remdesivir is what they gave my dad in the hospital. That was an emergency approved drug. I feel that it really did nothing. Uh, my dad was still suffering pretty severely until they gave him the convalescent plasma, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Chloroquine was suggested as a treatment. It's an antimalarial drug. It is extremely dangerous and has some very wicked side effects, so it's not recommended to be used as 
um, to prevent COVID-19 or to help treat COVID-19. Vitamin C, some critically ill patients have been given high doses of vitamin C. It has shown some evidence that it's effective, but you can't just take vitamin C to get over this. Like it's more severe of a virus than to be just treated with vitamin C. So vitamin C in supplement with other drugs is helpful. Another drug, uh, like I mentioned here before, is dexamethasone. So my dad was given dexamethasone, but again, the side effects with that one, you have to weigh the benefits and the side effects. It did help my, my dad breathe. So um, it did decrease the inflammation, which allowed him to be able to breathe. Convalescent plasma. So if a person gets COVID-19, their body is gonna develop antibodies against it because they're fighting this infection. Now, after they've recovered, about a month after they've recovered, they can go donate blood and they spin down the blood where the red blood cells go to the bottom and then you have plasma on the top. And that plasma has all those antibodies that kill the virus or don't kill it, but you know, attack it. They will target the virus and stick to it and be able to clear it from the body. So what they've been doing is giving plasma transfusions. So they take that plasma from one person, inject it into the next person, and it's supposed to clear out the virus. For the case of my dad, it worked. Like I said, within eight hours, he was off of a, a supplemental oxygen and he was feeling much better. In March of 2020, the FDA allowed treatment using donated plasma for patients suffering from life-threatening COVID-19. It's promising, but not yet safe and effective. However, I strongly believe that it is safe and effective and it's the best defense we have currently. And here are some additional resources for you to review. Now, I know I spent a long time talking about COVID-19. You will be tested on some of the details, um, not the details related to my personal history, but the facts. Um, like I talked about the receptor that it binds to, the um, type of virus it is, whether it's enveloped or naked, and then the type of genetic material that's found inside of it, and prevention and so forth. So make sure that you do read through that and pay attention to um, the details there. Other non-cellular infectious agents include prions, and prions cause spongiform encephalopathies. Prions are small infectious proteins, and spongy form is exactly what it sounds like. It looks like a sponge. Encephalopathies, or encephalopathies. So this is disease, brain, spongy form. So this is a spongy brain disease, basically, if you break down these terms. Prion diseases include Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease. Creutzfeldt-Jakob's disease is the human form of this prion disease. Uh, it affects the central nervous system of humans, causes gradual de de degeneration and death. We don't know how it's transmitted. Some people think that you can get it by eating um, infected brain or nervous system tissue. Several animals are victim of similar diseases. So scrapie is in sheep, mink, and elk. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy is in cows. That's mad cow disease. Scrapie actually causes the animals to want to scrape off some of their fur or even their skin. So it's a, a small infectious protein that gets inside of their brain and it causes these um, pores to form. It's a, it's a self-replicating protein that will cause a lot of inflammation and eventually death of that animal. But the symptoms of scrapie include um, consistent rubbing on one part of the body and then it'll rub until the, the skin falls off and becomes bloody and horrible looking. With mad cow disease, cows don't scrape up against anything. Rather, they, um, they start to act different. They separate themselves from the herd. They kind of look down with a blank stare. They don't come anymore during feeding time, so they get forgetful of their normal routine. They don't go into their normal stall. Eventually, they start staggering around. Um, their gait or their walk becomes um, imbalanced, and then eventually they fall over and they're unable to get up, and then uh, they die. So in the United States, we test heavily for the presence of mad cow disease before we send these animals to slaughter. It used to be an old practice where we would um, take sick animals and kind of grind them up and feed them to the other animals. And this is suspected to have spread prion-like diseases from one animal to the next.
Today, we're not really sure um, how people get it or how animals get it. We do know that there is a genetic form. So um, CJD can be inherited in certain families. But as far as how animals get it, there's not a lot of research surrounding prion diseases because they are extremely rare. So like I said, the exact mode of infection is unknown. Protein composition of uh, prions has been revolutionized or has revolutionized ideas of what can constitute an infectious agent. And then there's questions about how prions replicate given that they have no nucleic acid. So they're self-replicating proteins and they cause a wide variety of these diseases. Viroids are virus-like agents that parasitize plants. They are only RNA. So they're a piece of RNA that infect plants. Significant pathogens in economically important plants include tomatoes, potatoes, cucumbers, citrus trees, and um, chrysanthemums. So I gave a wide variety of um, information here. What's important to note is the main, main concepts and the main details. So when you review that study guide, make sure that you uh, only worry so much about what was in that study guide. I know this is a really long segment, but this is an important one because this is a, a, a major um, infection that just affected us. So um, this is gonna be talked about for many, many years. It's important to know the details about it.